as a coach, there is tremendous impact and this work is regenerative and being able to drop my own expectations of what a certain session will do for somebody or what something will do for somebody and let them walk their own path has been the most freeing thing I can do. Welcome to the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I'm dedicated to helping you take control of your life. Together, we'll explore practical tips, expert advice, and inspiring stories to help you overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Making small changes is possible and can lead to big results. Are you ready? Let's go do this. All right. Chase, so, welcome. Thank you very <laughs> you know, much. I listened to podcast yesterday with Austin and Austin is our mutual friend and I have been coaching with Austin for the last nine weeks. So I also know that you're a coach, but you have a lot more in your background. So I'm going to let you fill in a little bit of the story and then we'll just set the stage and, and roll from there. Awesome. Yeah. Here's the, here's the abridged version. Dad was an airline pilot. 9-11 happened when I was 13 years old. I mm. was then derailed from becoming a third generation airline pilot because the way that the industry flipped and there wasn't right. cash for a chase to learn how to fly. So directionless through high school. Fitness was my one passion. I stayed around town for four years after high school. I graduated in 2006, got my personal training certification in 2008, decided in 08 to start talking to the military. This work it is interesting. I mm. talked with the Air Force. I talked with the Army. They both said, sorry, you have that marijuana possession charge from when you were 18, so you're you're not going to be able to get a special warfare contract. So I, wanted to, I was 20 years old. I wanted to go do you know, cool manly stuff. And, uh, and I ended up walking in the Navy's office, and they said, yeah, you can get a Navy SEAL contract. You can go to Bud's like, and, and have a 30% chance at getting through. Just go get your eyes fixed. So at this point, my second cousin, my mom's cousin, who was retired Air Force, works, he's the senior civilian at Department of Naval Intelligence now. At the point, at the time, he was working missile defense at the Pentagon. He sent me a book to try and dissuade me. This book was later turned into the, a movie, some of you may have heard of it, called Lone Survivor. Mm. Now, he thought this book was going to be, oh, hey, this is real world stuff. Now, being 21 years old, I read it in three days, put my car up for sale to pay for LASIK and went all in. A and... For over a year, it was on paper, I was talking with the Navy. January 26, 2010, I go to contract in and they say, sorry, new instruction was sent out January 21st. You can't get that contract anymore. You're, you're no longer waverable to go to BUDS. At this point, I talked with three branches of the military over the last almost two years. And I said, all right, fine, just get me out of town as fast as possible. And between those two parts of the story going up and then saying, get out of town. My second cousin tried to get it pushed through for me at the Pentagon level and mm -hmm. it was a no go. So mm -hmm. they said, okay, you're leaving nine days. You work in the engine rooms. I got to my command. I thought maybe I'd try and go be a seal from there. I was at a small command. I'm really good with a wrench in my hands. And they said, no, we're not going to let you go. Even if you get approved. So over four years, wow. I grew disenfranchised with a broken leadership and advancement structure. I got out of the Navy in 2014, opened a gym, ran it for eight years. Throughout those eight years, realized that most people in the gym are just trying to feel the way they think fit people feel. So since the beginning of 2022, after a realization at the end of 2021, when my brother passed that I was running my gym for grocery money and missing out on family memories, I mm -hmm. shut my gym down. I've been coaching full-time online since 2022, and I am also involved in business acquisition and some, some real estate investment. So fitness, coaching, connect the dots between running a gym and the coaching space. Because coaching is like, yeah. we could go off on that deep end as well, yeah. because coaching in itself is just such a broad term. And I'm finding as I talk to more and more people, when I say to you, you know, I'm looking for a coach, you're going to get just a myriad of different answers because what a coach is to you is different than what a coach is to me. Mm -hmm. And it took me months to find a coach. Yeah, I, I believe so, it. So yeah, but back to my question, connect the dots between running a gym and now you're coaching. Great question. So I opened my gym in 2014 and at the time it was a CrossFit gym. I was like, oh, we're going to go to the games. We're going to go to regionals. We're going to do it. Then I realized that it was a bunch of moms and dads and grandparents and and working out in there. They just wanted to feel good about themselves. And we started shifting to more customized programming. And part of that customized programming was starting to take a look at 
well, what these people see is what they want from their fitness is created by the lens through which they've seen life, you know, and, and how that lens has been shaped. And then really got deep into the mindset work and had an individual on my podcast named Mark England. He was the one who I really learned about the power of language from. And when we talk about mindset, we can go so many different directions. If we want to make it practical, it, it can come down to the words we use. And the words we use can go a couple layers deep to the stories we tell ourselves and what words those stories are being shaped from. And when I had Mark on the podcast just to talk about words, he was standing up this thing called Enlifted. And I got in in the early days of learning the Enlifted method, which is story work. It's working the stories in people's heads. And it's quite literally the samurai sword that I was looking for to help my clients with mindset and so much more than that. It it clears any inkling of the imposter syndrome or the victim mentality, which I have a definition for the victim mentality. And it's a really practical four-step system. And, and getting into that in the last couple of years of owning a gym, I was like, this is, this is what actually pulls the lever. And owning a gym started to become almost misaligned for me because if you have a brick and mortar business, you want to retain people and keep them there and keep them paying. And if I create freedom out in someone and they can uh, go and work out on their own and they have a good right. mindset. And then they don't come back, then there's no repeat business. Exactly. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. It destroys the business model that you're trying to sustain. Yep. It doesn't make sense. So my yeah. coaching now, I'm, I, I literally tell people before they sign up with me, I want to coach myself out of a job. And I, I do it over and over again. I have guys that come back to me a year later and say, hey, it's been a year since we worked together and I just had the best year of my life. Wow. Yeah. How does that make you feel when you hear somebody come back and tell you that? In the beginning, that's an awesome mm -hmm. question. In the beginning, it was like, wow, this stuff's really awesome. And now, to be quite honest, it serves as a reminder to keep going. Because mm. even though I know this stuff's powerful, even though I have abracadabra tattooed massive on my back, because abracadabra comes from the ancient Aramaic for with my words I create, I can still get lost in the paces of this. And having, I had one of my clients on my podcast and it'll drop in a couple of weeks here. And we cut from podcasting and he said, dude, I meant to say this on the show because I wanted people to hear it and thank you for everything you've done for me. And it's been a year since we worked together. So it really, really keeps my fire lit to keep going with this is how it makes me feel. Yeah. I bet there's a level of satisfaction that you really can't capture with words when you know that you've touched somebody's life mm -hmm. in such a way that it is transformative. And you know what I'm starting to realize as I start my coaching journey, I had this revelation that this world, be, due to the fact that we have this amazing technology where I can talk with somebody who is on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you realize how vast and how huge our entire spinning globe is, you will never run out of people to help mm -mm. No. because there are so many hurting people out there. And because of the technology, we can reach people in places that we never would have imagined before. When you get somebody to tell you something like that, it wants you to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you'll never run out. It's funny that you say you want gets you to want to keep going. The two secrets to success in any endeavor in life. Mm -hmm. One, start. Two, keep going. Quite literally that simple. You know, I I have a, a post penned for my page because, you know, I, I thoroughly believe that fitness is a, a mainstay in any life well lived. And mm -hmm. I have a post pen that's going up my feed here soon that talks about any, even the worst fitness program will get you results sooner or later if you stick with it. You know, and I mean that a lot of people have seen the graph of the graph of 1% compounding day by day by day. You know, mm -hmm. 1% yeah, 1% better every day. Right, 1% better every day, which is very interesting. You know, we think our growth from when we're born, if you want to take it from there to where we are now, goes in a line. Like people just think about it that way that you're just growing and then each day you get a little bit better. But if you put your life against a graph where you're 1% better each day, it actually is exponential growth. It's yeah. not linear, linear in the line. Exponential is a curve. Mm -hmm. And at some point, if you challenge yourself to get 1% better every day in whatever area it is. And from the people that you've coached, you find that they don't have to change 10 different areas, right? You only have to pick one or two 
master those, continue that growth, then identify another area and keep going. And then what people don't understand about exponential growth is that it looks like a curve that goes up. Think of a plane yeah. going on a runway and then taking off. And it's a it hockey stick. You know, it's a hockey stick. Yeah. Yep. Hockey stick or the plane going up. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. that you're just going that way. So that's what that 1% better each day really means. And it just depends on how like how, how you show up too. Yeah. Showing up is huge and talking about exponential growth and 1% better. You know, I, an anecdotal example for that. I have a good buddy who I met him three plus years back now. And I met him at the beginning of his coaching journey. We were both in the, the a similar container, similar community. And we met at a a gathering in Virginia at a lake house of a bunch of coaches who learned the same methodology. And we were talking, we hit it off, right? We've been on each other's podcast. Well, in the last year, he got on the Aubrey Marcus podcast, which is a, a relatively big show. Mm -hmm. He is now Aubrey's most viewed episode on YouTube. Wow. Uh, he is a, a conscious cannabis coach and teaches people how to interact with cannabis in a, a very mindful and conscious way. And, and, and Ryan is, is one of my dear brothers. And it, it's such a great example of 1% better every day because he just, he started, he kept going. And next thing you know, he, he gets on this podcast and they say, Hey, I know Aubrey, get on Aubrey's podcast. He gets on Aubrey's podcast. And now his program is continually full and his life is exponentially different than it was three years ago. So he was actually on Austin's podcast as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah. So I watched that one and I think he showed up somewhere else too. I can't remember, but I saw him on there and fascinating guy to listen to. And I love one of the quotes, you know, all I can do is be faithful to speak the words that I, that, that I feel I need to speak, but how they're received has nothing to do with me. hundred percent. And, and yeah. how, how words are received are often been danced around this one often queued up and, and determined by the stories in people's heads and how they receive them, what kind of tone of voice they have in their head. And that's, you know, you, you talked earlier on different styles of coaching out there. And some people do really well in an area of life and say, Hey, I can, I've made a lot of money in real estate. I can coach people in real estate. I've, I've done this. I can coach people in this. Austin is really good at seeing people who they are five years from now and, and helping them move into that. And, and some people out there are coaches who say, Hey, this is the system that worked for me. This is where I know how to teach. I have the answers for this. I have a lot of answers. I've also come to realize that for me and for a lot of the people I know, questions are the best way to coach. Yep. And when we get people's stories out on the paper mm -hmm. and we look at them and we honestly look at them, like read them out and uh, it can be transformative because we can take the power out of a stuck story and then we can start changing the words in it. And next thing you know, we're looking at a whole different story in a whole different life. Right. And it doesn't have as much power over you when you get it out of your head onto paper. So I'll put mm -hmm. in a shameless plug that doing the story work since I've been coaching with Austin has radically transformed who I am. Mm. So who I was nine weeks ago is not who I am today. We all carry baggage and stories from youth or from our 20s, or from our 30s. And in my case, I had stories from my 40s. I even had stories from my year 50. Mm -hmm. You know, we carry these stories around and then we allow them to shape and define who we are. Me personally, putting them out on paper, interacting with them, and understanding that this is the past and they don't dictate my future. And the only reason they have power over me is because I have allowed it. And the most freeing thing in the world was to look at these stories. And some of them from my childhood were, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say the word traumatic because traumatic means different things to different people. So even though my story might not seem traumatic to somebody else, it was still traumatic to me. If that's the biggest level of input that your nervous system has imprinted, then that's the level of trauma that your nervous system knows. And, and then to work through those stories and to release that trauma yeah. is just absolutely, I, I, I really don't quite have words for it yet because it's still new on my journey, but transformative. I'm like, I'm naming my year this year, my year this year is radical transformation. 
I and I already na- I already named next year and it's massive expansion. I, I use one year on repeat and it's the best year ever. Ah. Over and over oh. and over again. Love it. I love that one too. Well, I can have radical transformation and make it the best year ever. Hundred <laughs> percent. You can have different different themes with ease. Yeah, I mean to say it with ease. Mm. That's another thing I do when I'm faced with something that's quote unquote impossible. But I don't look at things as impossible anymore. I look at things as just uncommon. Mm-hmm. So it's not an impossible target. It's just an uncommon target, and I'm going to hit that target with ease. If you take the, if you put a space between the M and the, e, and the P and impossible. Right. Because I'm, I'm possible. I'm possible. Yeah. yeah. I'm possible. You know, I love that. You said, say it with ease. And it reminded me of, I heard do- Dr. Mark Gaffney on the Lifestylist podcast. He was a guest on there. Break down uh, that the, the symbols and letters in the old Aramaic abracadabra. And I'm paraphrasing here. It's about 30, 33 minutes into, it was called the God pod was the title of the episode for anybody that wants to check it out and hear Mark Gaffney say it in his own words. And essentially, you know, in in old Hebrew Aramaic, each symbol is also has its own meaning as well as being part of the word. And one symbol means word. And then the next one means silence. And part of abracadabra with my words I create is that the words support the silence. And when you said that there, that I I say it with ease, to me, what comes up is there are some people who can, and it could be a start to change our words. It's it's the start, Mm -hmm. it's the easiest lever to pull and changing them until they support the silence underneath, until they are in line with the feeling, the emotion, the resonance in our heart to go a little Joe Dispenza on it. Well, then things just start happening. That that's when authenticity mm-hmm. comes through. Do you think authenticity is one of the core foundations for radical transformation in somebody's life? I'm so glad you decided to pull on the authenticity thread. So have you seen the chart of like vibrational levels, peace, love, joy are near the top, no, uh, I have fear not. and loneliness are at the bottom? Well, mm, they've no. recently done some studies that humans resonate a little higher than peace and joy, a lot higher actually at authenticity and much, much higher. So yes. Have you, did I talk about grandfather clocks in that podcast? You no, not, not yet. But before we leave the authenticity space, yeah. how do you see authenticity working in conjunction with vulnerability? This is something that I've been, that I first started chewing out or really opened up for myself and got out onto paper on a journaling, uh, 2020, I believe, Punta Cana turned into one of my tracks that's on Spotify, my buddy remix, a little philosophy album. And vulnerability starts within. And it's it, like actually getting honest and vulnerable, like sitting and staring in the proverbial mirror until mm-hmm. what comes up comes up. And then when you see it, asking what's underneath that and then asking what's underneath that. And when you get intentional with that practice, it can become automatic. And this is where I like to talk about, you know, it takes discipline to instill that practice. And once you do it over and over again, you can embody it. And then when you can be authentically vulnerable with yourself over and over again throughout the day, yeah, maybe you slip, maybe I, you know, get a little short with my wife every once in a while, like, and five minutes later, I can turn around and be like, that was me. That wasn't you. Like, as opposed to it's doing all day. So vulnerability is one of the biggest on ramps to the highway that is authenticity. Mm. Do you have an example for those who are listening? They're like, Oh, I have no idea what it even looks like to be vulnerable or the, even the questions to start asking oneself to dig deep into vulnerability, to become more vulnerable because vulnerability, if I hear you correctly is saying will lead to authenticity and they're going Mm -hmm. to go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to specific questions, I would, I would pose this one and it's an, an invitation, which I like to say instead of suggestion, I would invite anyone out there to put down anything you're consuming books, even if it's a, a self-development nonfiction book, podcast, social media, stop consumption for 45 minutes, 
And if, if, if you want to do something, go for a slow walk by yourself with no devices and see what comes up. What I'm doing here is tricking you guys into meditating and sitting with your thoughts. <laughs> I was just ready to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I was just ready to say that. Do you know, I, I'm guessing, but maybe not. We might have a mutual friend, Mark Picard. Do you know Mark? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he has the, you know, 10 minutes and shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, if everybody would do that 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes night every day, you would transform your life in less than three months. I took him up on that challenge when I heard him say that on a podcast two months ago. So I'm two months in and he's absolutely right. It didn't even take three months. I, yes, well, then you've coupled that, that with working with Austin. So you're just, you're yeah, on yeah, fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. yeah. <laughs> in that case, but the, the mental, like, as you're saying, when you turn off all, if I hear you correctly, when you turn off all the external noise, you are only left with the voice in your head. Yep. And how many of us walk around not even getting in touch with that voice and knowing what it says? Yeah. So there's the beginning of vulnerability. And and I'll, I'll give them an, another actionable piece there. When you get back from that walk, and, and make it 45 minutes, go long. When you get back from that walk, have a journal and a pen on your table. And then when you walk in your house, grab that pen and just start writing mm -hmm. until you Bring until down. the pen stops. Because once you've had that quiet, there's nobody else's input to go into that writing. It's all you. True. True. What's your thoughts on the act of physically writing versus grabbing the record button on your phone when you're in the moment and you have that thought? Writing allows us to see it. You know, it, it's a similar mechanism to story work in which you've experienced. Physically grabbing the phone is great. And like it, if you're in the moment and you've got it, like speak it into existence and put it on the recording. And I would right. still invite everybody out there to write it down because then we can go back and read it. And we can see mm -hmm. as we read it, the mechanism that you've experienced, what feelings are in there, what's going on in that and how can we shift that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I've done both. And when I speak it actually, and I guess I should have clarified this, mm -hmm. it is talk to text. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that's, that's what I've been using. I've uh, used some, I've used some talk to text journaling apps and I, I am going to look it up after this podcast. I've heard from some of my mentors that there is a specific difference in your brain when it watches you write the words down. So I agree. I agree. I love hiking. I discovered hiking a couple mm. of months ago. So I go out, there's a trail out here. I hiked a couple of weeks ago. I went six, six and a half miles. It was like four hours out in the middle of nowhere with quiet, but it was me and my phone, but it wasn't me and my phone on Facebook. It was me. And then I would get this inspiration for a podcast short because I do shorts on Wednesdays. I'd get this inspiration. I'd whip out my phone, automatically make a note, put it away. It's like, wow, that just hit me. I captured it. Yeah. Or another would come out and this has happened to me where I'm working through a difficult situation. And like you said, you go out for that walk when it's quiet, it allows your brain to come to revelations that you didn't think you would have had before. Mm -hmm. So that walking, that silence that you talk about is just so critical. I can't plug it enough. For those who need to find, figure out their authentic self and, and get back to vulnerability and learn who they are, start in the silence. It's, it's massive. And talking about authenticity, you know, I, I had plugged the grandfather clock thing early on mm -hmm. and, and I want to, this ties into Yeah, please talk about that. Mm -hmm. because it's, it's the law of entrainment and a physicist whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce in the 1600s was laid up in bed and he was in the UK. And he, because he was in his room sick, he was working with two grandfather clocks because that's what physics was in the 1600s. And when he would put them back together, he would realize that after a while, the pendulum started swinging in sync, regardless of where he put them back together. He went into whatever governing by the ministry of science or at the time was laughed out of the room saying that, Hey, there's something going on here. Now, in recent decades, it's been proven that those grandfather clocks were communicating through tiny vibrations in their wooden housings. That same underlying mechanism happens when dripping faucets sync up. It's the tides and the moon. It's why female cycles sync up. It's the same 
vibrational mm -hmm. aspects. So no longer is it like this woo woo, like everything is vibration. Like no, there, there are literal, I mean, Joe Dispenza does this with his work that the heart can be, and, and the heart math Institute too, the heart can be measured at least three feet away from like Stanford science, not something somebody made up and put on Gaia TV. You know, so when we look at all of this, that we have a vibration and that here's the fun part. If you put a bunch of grandfather clocks in the same room as each other, they all fall in sync with the biggest grandfather clock in the room. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So authenticity creates the strongest, biggest pendulum. And now this is, I like to tie this into a second concept, the three degrees of influence, your habits, your, your actions, your beliefs, your addictions, your thought patterns are contagious to your friends, friends, friends. Now, if I'm the biggest grandfather clock, three circles forward and back, I'm not, I'm not picking up the negative, the bad addictions, the negative thought patterns, the hurtful beliefs that come back towards me. I'm only sending out the good and the authentic. So how does that tie in then when you hear people talk about their circles and you hear it come up, change your friends, change your life. Mm -hmm. So how does that tie in with that? You just mentioned that if you're the biggest person in the room, then your friends or what's yeah. around you isn't influencing you. So it almost sounds contradictory. So explain how that wouldn't be contradictory. What I think I'm missing something. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm so glad you went here because this is something I said first on what I'm about to say. I said first on an Instagram live a few years back and it ended up like three people were like, hey, come on my podcast because that I love the way you frame that. And yeah, you are a direct reflection of the five people with whom you spend the most time. That's fun. And it's a, it's a big projection and hands off our ownership of our actions because we put ourselves in, our, in that circle. Our habits, our actions, our beliefs, and who we are put ourselves with those people. They are a reflection of us. So we could either choose to say like, ah, I'm just a reflection of my friends and I need new friends. Well, how are you going to get new friends? You got to be the person that belongs in that room too. So our friends are a reflection of us. The five people with whom we spend the most time are a reflection of our habits, our beliefs, our actions, our values, and how we live our life. I choose to look at it that way because it gives me a lot more ownership and authority over who I am. So how does that, if you're the person who's going to influence if you have those habits, actions, and beliefs, and you're the one influencing your friends, 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 how does that work then? Is that just because you are more confident and solid in your authenticity and vulnerability to a level and degree that's higher than those who are around you? And therefore, that's how you influence your friends, friends, friends? Is that how that works versus being in the room where, where you're in a room of equals? where you chose them and they're all influencing each other. Well, and that, that's the thing, right? You can, you can still pick up stuff from your friends and to, to imagine that we're always the biggest in every aspect is, is likely a little foolhardy and to, to know that we stand full in our authenticity and only pick up what we want to be able to see others perspectives and stand strong in our own or to see others perspectives and implement that if we want and, and recognize when something is pinging in our subconscious. That's when we're the biggest grandfather clock in the room. Ah, uh, okay. So if I hear you correctly, when you're listening to yourself, that thing that pings inside of you, that's going to come out of listening to the voices and listening to the dialogue that goes on inside of your head. And then also would you agree that that ties back to the story work and the stories that we tell ourselves? So if we're telling our stories in a way that develop a vulnerability and authenticity and rewrite some of those experiences to project, like to bring us into the person we want to become, then that's what's going to help us be the quote unquote bigger grandfather clock in the room even though it's not necessarily meaning we're the most important or the biggest ego in the room. Yeah. It just means we understand and know who we are as a person. 100%. I have left three rooms now where I heard the most recent time and I've heard it after the fact, the most mm -hmm. recent time I heard it in person where it was mother's day at my sister's house and she had her, all of her in-laws there. So her sister-in-laws and their husbands. And I was sitting at the table with two of her, her, her sister-in-laws and one of their husbands and my wife and I, and our at the time six, seven month old 
got up to leave. We were walking out and one of her sister-in-laws over in the living room goes, I feel lighter just after talking with him. And that's, that's impact to me. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoy coaching. I love that impact too. And when I can make an impact in any room I'm in, and when I get together with individuals who get this, then it's a bunch of big grandfather clocks helping each other become more and more accurate, you know, and there are rooms that you are, that, that I'm in where I'm the, the biggest grandfather clock helping other people feel lighter after I leave. So that lightness that she felt when you were getting ready to go, um, talk about how that manifests itself in your life. <laughs> I mean, you know, for me, there are still moments where the, the victim mentality comes up, so to speak, you know, uh, an acquired personality trait where an individual tends to regard themselves as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. And it depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. I can still get spun up in my head. I just have the flashlight to shine on that monster in the corner and realize it's just a pile of dirty laundry and get on with my day. And that lightness that she felt when I was, when I left the room to me, were were continually circle around authenticity here because I'm able to sit at a table and much more than 17 year old or 21 year old or 25 year old or 28 year old chase was able to do just talk, just be myself without any constriction. And I'm, I'm full in my breath. You know, you can feel it when you walk into a house where a couple has been arguing, you can mm -hmm. feel it when you walk into a home where a tumultuous relationship exists. Mm -hmm. You can feel it when somebody's angry when they walk in. So you can also feel when somebody is comfortable in themselves and that radiates out to the next person, the next person that, that manifests in my daily life that even when things are in a state where some people might go, oh man, we need to change everything. Oh, uh, abort course. Like let's go over here oh, and start and keep going. And it's turned out great. You know, that feeling of being light do you use anything? And, and the reason I'm asking is because I've done it myself where you have these negative thoughts, negative emotions, or negative things coming from outside of you coming at you or something happens and it's negative. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just like a negative, regardless of whether it's internal or external, there is for me a visualization that goes on where I visualize that negativity, acknowledging it and then passing through me and allowing it to leave. And do you think something like that also helps people to stay in that light, light space? And what does that look like for you? I love this question. I, I love the way you framed it. And I'll, I'll answer it this way. For me, we're talking about resilience. And the more weight you can lift, the lighter everything else feels, you know, to use a, a fitness term. And Joseph Campbell, said any feeling felt all the way through is bliss. So when something comes up for me, whether it's frustration, whether it's grief, I sit in it and I let myself feel it all the way through because where a lot of people are misled is they don't allow themselves to feel it and they drag it through their day and it affects everything else. It's dragging behind them like a bunch of cans and chains just wiggling around, banging on everything they passed. Do you think that stems from our societal belief, this misconception that if we don't deal with something that's difficult, it actually makes us appear stronger because we're not dealing with it. But in reality, it's messing us up even more. Yeah. And so you've got this, you know, you got this thing, oh, I, I'm not going to deal with that loss of that person, or I'm not going to deal mm -hmm. with the divorce that just happened or this, you know, I got fired. Okay. I'm just going to let it go or not let it go, but just not deal with it. And then from there, it's like people just look for alternative ways to deal it, whether it's drugs or alcohol or, you know, name the pick drugs, advice. alcohol, adrenaline junkies. Yeah. You know, for, for too long, it's been, well, I'm just going to decide I'm happy and not look at those things. And it, then there's a great book, the body keeps the score, you know, and, and this, this stuff, it patterns into our body, into our tissues, into our limbic brain, into our nervous system. And then something else will come up that feels a little bit like that. And it pulls that scab off of that mole hill that turns or that ant hill that turns into a mole hill that turns into a hill that turns into a mountain that turns into Mount Everest. And then something nasty comes up like an unexpected loss of a close one. And, and that feels like everything bad you've ever felt. And then your grief lasts for two and a half years because you never processed any of that. 
Now, if we had processed that stuff in the back, well, guess what? This comes up and wait, I have these tools. I process all that stuff. Now I can dress this wound before it turns into a scab that I need to pick off. What's a small step somebody could do? They're listening to this going, oh my God, I've got this big giant mountain. And what do you do? What can you do? I, I give away the four-step method on any podcast that asks this question. So whatever that mountain is, title it and write it down. That's step one. Then check in with your feelings. What do you feel? Where is it in your body? Step two, read it out loud. Check in with yourself again. Step three, read it out loud like you left the driveway with the parking brake on. About 80% speed. Check in with yourself again. Step four, read it out loud with a breath at every period, most of the commas and some of the ands, and check in with yourself again. That's the start of when I coach people. And that start alone, often for me sharing that on podcasts, I'll get numerous messages. Hey, you know, I just work through this this of my, my addiction pattern, my relationship, my childhood stuff. Thank you so much for sharing that. Just that can help air a story out. And then if we go in and we change the words, but I'll say, practice that with the stories in your head and implement meditation. Because when you can embody both of those skills, well, now when you're sitting in meditation, you can see the story and the mechanism behind it and the mechanism behind that and release it with stories that are light enough that don't require getting them out on the paper. And when you're day to day, if you've been meditating for a while and you've been working stories, well, now you can, you start seeing things. And I'm, I'm a firm believer. I'm, I'm a bigger and bigger believer each day that enlightenment is just seeing reality as it truly is. And when you can, when you can see your thought patterns and your emotions for what they are, you can drop a lot of your personal biases, not all of them. They're all, they're ingrained in our head. And, you can, right. and you new can, ones will pop up too. New ones will pop up and you can get closer and closer to being able to truly see reality for what it actually is. Do you have a story of somebody who you've worked with that's had, that had experienced a ra radical transformation like that? Yeah. And I'll, I'll go back to the one that I just referenced who I had on my podcast this week, because I know he's, he's shared it and he's good with sharing it. My client, Rob, he started drinking at a young age and he heard me give away that four step process on a podcast. And he had recently, um, he had heard on another podcast, the host say, ask yourself, what's one thing that you can't stand that you do and give it up. And his buddy, and he posed this question to each other and he'd been drinking for about nine hours at that point that day. And he looked at the whiskey in his, in his hand and said this, and he heard me a couple of days after that give that process away on a podcast. And he went and he wrote it down. Mm -hmm. This work is so, 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 so practical. And I've also went deep down some esoteric rabbit holes and it's the biggest form of energy work I've ever seen. In our first session, he was working a relatively big story and there was audible popping in his upper back and his shoulders. His posture when we started working together, it was forward shoulders, hunched over, protective in his chest. And he was sitting up bigger and releasing tension in his back. He had more mobility than ever in his thoracic spine. And now if you saw a picture of Rob before we started working together compared to now, he looks like he's two inches taller. And it shows in his persona and the way he shows up and the father he is and the man he is. Oh, amazing. Very inspirational. I'm sure that's one of many stories that you have. I've done over 500 sessions. So I've got, I've got a fair amount. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Let's circle back around. You suggested you wanted to talk about the victim mentality. Was there anything else you wanted to add to what we were talking about, about victim mentality? I'll, I'll break open that definition a little bit. And then yeah, I want to make sure like there's the victim mentality and there's like you could be a victim of something and still release the victim mentality. So the victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where an individual tends to regard themselves the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. And it depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. So it's, it's acquired. We pick it up somewhere along the way. Our parents, our teachers, the media, movies, books, whatever it is, depends on habitual thought process. We, we feed this thing. Right. And we look at it, we create it, and then we continue feeding it, even in the absence of clear evidence. 
is created out of the stories in our head and the words we use. And these words program our reticular activating system, which for anybody listening, the, the go-to example of the reticular activating system is I will bet you when you bought your most recent car, you started noticing more of that cars on the street. Because as Friedrich Nietzsche said, what you look at is what you see. So if we are constantly using words that somebody else hurt us or that somebody did something to us or our mood is somebody else's fault or our position in life is somebody's fault or the reason we haven't hit our goals is somebody else's fault, we are going to look for all those reasons. The reason that we quit is somebody else's fault. We're going to look for all of those reasons. And you know, Joe Dispenza talks about even if we remove that person that we're blaming from our life, our body can stay uh, addicted to those patterns, those emotions. So we look for something else. Now, Joe's right. And short of going to one of his three to five day retreats and meditating your face off, which I'm all for, if you got the resources and the time for that, changing our words is the longest lever and the strongest fulcrum that we can pull to change the world. Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum strong enough and I can change the world. And when we change our language, it can sound so simple until somebody experiences it. And just going from should, I should do something to I could do something to I can do something because mm -hmm. is I've seen people cry at that one. And it'll reprogram our reticular activating system. And then we start seeing all the opportunity in front of us. We start seeing all the things we can do and you change your words. You release the victim mentality. You get true space and clarity. It's that simple. Wow. So the victim mentality is how we view an event ourselves through our lenses and what we would tell ourselves about that event, true or not. And then whether or not we continue to feed that. And the more we feed that, the more we feel like that victim. But when mm -hmm. we're conscious and this can be done through meditation or story work or combination thereof. When we take that event and we're conscious of it, it allows us to interact with it and then eventually release it so that we don't project it onto other people, things or other experiences so it doesn't continue to grow. Did I hear that yeah. correctly? Yeah, summed up, <laughs> summed up beautifully. And you said feed it. And it brings up the, the old Native American proverb of talking to this, this old leader, his grandpa's talking to a bunch of young men and saying, inside you, there are two wolves, one dark and one light. One of the guys asks, well, which one wins? The one you feed. Mm -hmm. So the victim yeah. mentality is the dark wolf. Yeah. And I, you know, one of the things I think that frustrates, probably frustrates you, frustrates me, is we hear the victim mentality and the victim card thrown out there without any thought at all. And... I think that there's a lot of people out there that, that when they hear victim mentality, they have their definition of what they think it means, but it's probably not an accurate definition. <laughs> you uh, know, I, I've seen a lot of influencers and, and people who have built big businesses for themselves and have nine figure businesses, like good for you. And talking about victims and victim and, and they're using this shame based talk about it. And it's like, they are hurt because people are victims. And it's like, unless they, their, their victim mentality destroyed your business or did something to you, why is it personal? You know, it is, is where my mind goes with that question that you asked, because when we release the victim mentality, we can release other aspects of it as well. And I'll, I want to toss this nugget out there as, as you're delving into your coaching career, I want to toss this nugget because this one blew my mind wide open. What does every victim need? I would think that every victim is looking for validation that what they have experienced is something against them, mm. that they were wronged against. And I would even dare to go a little bit farther and say that that victim believes they had no part in what it was that they had experienced. It happened to them, not for them. For them, or even, you know, to get a little extreme with it, by them. Because, you know, after childhood, your actions in life, whether wittingly or unwittingly, put you in that situation. And we can own that. That's That's been big for some people. And everybody listening, whatever lands with you the most, go with that. If you like for you, go with for you. If you like by you, go with by you. And victims, to get out of that state, what do they need? 
who do they need to get out of that victim mentality? Who they need, I think, is a different version of themselves to see the circumstance or whatever they believe they were victimized against, to see it in a different light. So mm -hmm. they're, all, they're going to be the only ones to pull them out of the victim mentality because they need to rewrite how they view that event so that they're no longer the victim. That That's yeah. what I think I, they would need to do. I love that answer. And a lot of victims are in search of a hero. They're mm -hmm. in search of a savior. Right. And I'll flip that Somebody around. Somebody outside of themselves. Yeah. What does every hero need? A victim to save. Right. Uh, this one blew, blew my mind open when one of my dear friends, Ryan Wallace, shared it with me. It's like, Oh, that's where I was three years ago. You know, the, the fitness coach has said, well, if you just read that book, it'd be fine. Like, why won't you do what I say? Like, I, I can help you just do it. You know, and as, as a coach, there is tremendous impact and this work is regenerative and being able to drop my own expectations of what a certain session will do for somebody or what something will do for somebody and let them walk their own path has been the most freeing thing I can do. Right. Because coaching isn't just about me helping you. Mm -hmm. It goes both ways. Even a podcast. Look at a podcast. You know, I'm talking to you. I'm getting value from listening to you. And I'm sure you're getting value listening to me. What you focus on expands. If you're looking for that to happen, then it's going to happen. Yeah, totally. And I'll echo my sentiments from earlier. Whatever we experience in life can be the most traumatic thing we can experience and that that could be our version of trauma, so to speak. And then mm -hmm. There could also be small T and big T trauma. And some people have been through some really hairy stuff. Now, yeah, that that's still that somebody else did that like it that somebody else did that to you. And are we going to stare at that story and what somebody else did? And we're going to look in the rear view, or are we going to look forward? Becomes the difference there for me. Because we're not, we're not victim shaming. We're not saying, oh, well, why'd you get raped? That was silly. Don't go do that. You know, like that, that would be just absolutely asinine. And going through and processing that story, doing the story work, I've done a fair share of those in story work. It's powerful. It still releases it because where a lot of the knee jerk from what I've seen, a lot of the knee jerk, well, what about this happens is mm -hmm. because they have that story in there that they have yet to actually accurately and honestly look at. And it's still creating an anthill to a molehill to a mountain of emotion. Do you find like a lot of times people will get argumentative about what it means to be a victim and it's only because they're holding on to their own stories and they're trying to project that out as well, that yeah. there's things. And I think that's what I hear you saying, that they haven't dealt with their own stories first or mm -hmm. their own traumas. And while you're talking, I'm also thinking about, think of the instances where extremely traumatic events where people were the victim of something where a lot of good came out of it. You know, I'm thinking of the lady who started Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mm. So I guess it's just what lens you view that action towards you and what you're going to do with it going forward. There are mechanisms at play that regardless of who has tried to describe the underlying forces of the universe or what religion you decide to, to, to worship, I, I fully support any choice anybody makes. And I, I don't claim to understand any of it. And when my brother passed on November 27, 2021, I'd already done this work. So like, yeah, that could have been like the biggest thing I experienced because it was, he was 27, passed unexpectedly. PepsiCo was trying to get my wife to relocate to outside Dallas. So Plano, I believe. And we were supposed to go down there on Monday, I believe, right after. And he passed on Friday after Thanksgiving. I didn't go because I was going to stay with my family. She went to keep up appearances. We weren't planning on moving and she wanted to maintain good relations at her job. So she gets on the plane and my seat, which we had canceled like 24 hours prior, the last seat open on the plane, the guy that got it was going down to see his nep nephew who was terminally ill and had maybe hours left to live. And it was his only chance mm -hmm. to get to say bye to his nephew because my seat got opened up. So I say that because like 
is there is there definitely a piece of me that's like well what the where's my brother though like yeah sure and the more i stare at that the more i stare at everything in the past the story that i went into this work with that was really pinging around in my head or and it, one of the big ones i thought it was the navy seal story the one that was holding the most emotional baggage was my father and i got into a fight one of our only ever physical altercations when i was 17 and i, I hospitalized him Mm. And for the longest time, I would tell people about this, but this this is what I'm talking about. I would go, yeah, I hospitalized my dad. 32 stitches in his face, broken nose, four staples in the back of his head. And just blow right by the guilt and the emotion I felt. And so when I worked it, it's like, oh, I feel dangerous. And we worked that. And then it went to, well, wait, I was only 17. I tried to de-escalate. My dad basically bullied his 17-year-old into fighting him. And then it went to, Oh shit, my dad's got stories too. And and this is over the period of like two years. I was sitting in meditation one night and just blew me wide open and I cried for like half an hour talking about feeling it all the way through. And I was like, my dad's got stories too. And he did a lot of good as a father. A lot more than a lot of dads. And I know because the amount of story work I've done and, and the amount of clients I've worked with. Somebody out there is begging for your problems. And I started crying because like unbeknownst to me, I had created a rift from even though I thought I had addressed this story, still the the rift that I had subconsciously put between my dad and I. And I grabbed my phone and I wrote, I, I titled the note, I see you, dad. And I probably like half an hour to start. I remember this. I remember that. I remember this. I remember that. And then I shared the note with him. So, And then what happened? He texted me a couple of times since then that when grief hits him hard about my brother, he goes to that note. So... Mm. Yeah. Was this just recently then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was like this spring. Oh, wow. Yeah. And if you think the journey, so you carried, done, yeah. Yeah. So you carried it around. I'm 35. You were, you're 35. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time to carry that story around. Yeah. I first but addressed you know it about three years ago. And then it was like two and a half years of like just peeling. There's layers to stories. Thank you for sharing that because I know somebody listening. Who might be thinking, well, I'm too old to address something that happened 20 or 30 years ago. You're never too old. It's I've had so many clients that are like, oh, yeah, I'm 50, 51, 60, and I'm stepping into a whole new world for the first time in my life. Who coaches the coach? <laughs> are you asking me who coaches me or? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can answer yeah. that how you like. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let that I'll let that up to you. Well, it's I mean, that right there is one. That's a great question because I have numerous coaches who are clients. You know, I've seen it where some coaches can get stuck. If we know Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, the ordinary world is at the top of the circle and the hero's journey is a circle. It's not an oval. A lot of people sit in that ordinary world for a little too long, even coaches They're like, yeah, yeah, I went and I got the elixir. Now I'm back in the ordinary world and I'm going to spread the elixir. No, we get to keep diving in. You know, a lot of people say hurt people, hurt people. I like to translate it to heal people, heal people. And really more accurately, it's healing people, heal people, because things will constantly come up. And unless we are open and ready to be vulnerable and address them on the regular, you'll end up a hurt people again. That makes sense. In your experience, though, do you find that when you go full cycle of that hero's journey that you find you're a little bit higher or better? I, I don't I don't want to say the word better, but you're in a one percent better place than what you were on the last cycle as you go through that. Yeah, and, and it will some sometimes I know I'm heading into it. Other times I get on the other side of it. It's like, oh, that's what went on. We just went around the circle again. And the way I like to see it, you know, the hero's journey, if it's a circle, you don't come back out of the circle and like get right to the top. It kind of like shoots you out of the loop a little higher and then the next circle goes up and mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like that one percent better graph is a mm -hmm. bunch of little squiggles spiraling up and up and up going and up. upwards yeah. yeah are you familiar with ray dalio's work in principles yes yeah he wrote the book principles yep. yeah he he does a lot of pictures within his book and as you were explaining the spirals going up mm. I, I that's the picture that i saw from his book he's amazing yeah he was introduced to the hero's on. journey like a couple of years before he wrote that so he really like if, okay. if, if i remember correctly because i listened to it and I, I think his son gave him a book about joseph campbell and mm. and he so he incorporated a lot of that into his story 
So, you know, I like to ask, what's one topic or question you wish I would have asked about and how would you answer or expand on it? Hmm. I mean, you're, you're a thorough host. One that I wish you would have asked about. Honestly, we, we covered all of my favorite stuff. And Dude, if, if anything, just how the, the physical can impact the mental and how it's a circle. And while the mental definitely starts the journey, I believe physical fitness can be a great gateway drug to personal development. My coaching these days, physical fitness is the side dish because I'm going to just give you the hard stuff right away and you know, serve the gate, the, the other stuff as a garnish. And it, it's still to me very important because of whatever it is that comes through you on your hikes, however, we get these intuitive hits, you know, there are, there are some people in my circles and, and like I said, I don't, I don't claim to understand any of this. And I, I've seen some stuff that, that would stand to reason that there's another force out there. And if our body is the vessel through which that force comes, whatever it is that we believe it is, then it makes sense to keep that vessel as clean and healthy as possible so that that force can come through it. So what's the one small step that someone can do today that's going to help them change their tomorrow as we close on that thought? Go for a 45 minute walk and leave a notebook on the counter. And then find a story coach if it resonates. A absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? I do have one more question for you. What would you say to those who are still on the fence about coaching and they know they need one, but they're not quite ready to oh, do it yet, God. or they don't want to spend the money or they're hesitating. What would you suggest? If you don't want to spend the money on a coach and you have an iPhone that's newer than two years old or a car payment or anything else that a financial coach would look at you and say, what are you doing? It's likely not the money. And, and I ran a gym for eight years. It's almost never the money with, with stuff that can be a perceived luxury. And I say perceived luxury intentionally, health, mm -hmm. personal development. They, these are the things that create true lasting generational impact. And what I would say is our nervous system, our subconscious can have an almost autoimmune response to change. And it's, it's programmed smartly because not too long ago in the history of humans, if we changed one little thing, we might get eaten. So I get it and I understand. And guess what? You're going to be fine. You'll be alive. And I, a 90% chance that 99% chance that you'll be better for the journey. So if you want to go a little deeper before, but if that's not enough of an answer, ask yourself this question before you go on your walk. Why am I resistant to getting a coach? What is there in there that I don't want to look at? Because I promise you, my friend, whatever there is that you're trying not to look at is where you want to look to find the most freedom in your life. Boom. Boom. Thank you for sharing that. And the funny thing is the reason I asked that is because I spent months being resistant to spending the money on a coach. And when I realized that the best way I could spend the money is investing in myself first because it will get me to where I need to go, then I released the hold that was on my money and allowed me to make that quote unquote purchase. And it was, it was no chump change, but the difference between me spending that am amount of money for a coach and say buying somebody else's program or doing something equal in cost is that I had no regret. Yeah. I had no regret. I did it. I spent the money. I have no regret. Nine weeks later, I, he, he's worth twice as much what I paid for him. I mean, a, I, a, a good personally. coach will get that. A good coach will get yeah. that. I, I have uh, episode 99 of my podcast. I had one of my recent clients on. He said after two sessions, he received double his investment. So, wow. Um, yeah. A yeah. good coach will get that. And, and I mean, it's a, it's a, for, to work with me for three months, it's a four figure investment. And like I said, I'm here to coach myself out of a job. So, <laughs> well, as we come to a close chase, how can people find you and any parting thoughts? Find me on Instagram at coach underscore chase underscore Tolleson. If I don't respond to your messages right away, it's because I have an app blocker on that keeps me in there intentionally as opposed to mindlessly scrolling or chase You can sign up to get my emails there and send out my 
my thoughts that I get on on the paper about what can help people's journeys, authentic thoughts weekly. What's the name of your podcast? Oh, Primal Man Podcast. That one. And if you want to hear Chase's philosophy, the album Mystical Giants on Spotify. And one last thing, you have infinitely more power than you're giving yourself credit for. And when you decide to start playing at that level, your life will become everything you dreamed it could be and more. Perfect way to end. Hmm. Chase, thank you so much for your time. This has been a gift and I have enjoyed every moment of it. I cannot believe time has gone by. It's an hour and it feels like it was only five minutes. So thank you for an amazing episode. Thank you for the gift of your time. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I value your time with me and I seek to make every moment count. In order to make lasting change in your life, listening is usually not enough. So I want to ask you, what practical steps are you going to put into action today as a result of listening to this podcast? Remember, any step, any action, no matter how small, starts your journey to a big win. And if you're not sure where to get started, check out my website, personalcoachfinder.com and find someone who can help. Remember, life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. Take small steps today and make your life awesome, friends.